So the stakes have never been higher. The threats have never been more serious. The challenges have never been more daunting. But the opportunities have never been more compelling. But first, what are the clues that there's an opportunity for deconstruction? How do you know if you've encountered a process, a team, a company, or maybe even an industry that's ready to be torn apart and rebuilt? Well, it turns out that there are clues, leading indicators, warning signs that can tip you to the need for deconstruction. The first clue is in goals. You and your team are having trouble setting and or achieving goals. Now, it's difficult to pull together those disparate functions, sales and marketing and engineering and finance and service delivery and operations to arrive at common goals, real goals in writing with money attached. That's difficult. But even when you forge agreement around those common goals, the team frequently misses them, often without apparent consequence. The second type of clue is around performance. So you've got some kind of evidence, statistical or anecdotal evidence, that you're falling short of the competition in some way. You're getting beat. Now, this could be a traditional business goal like growth and revenue or profitability, or it could be something that's specific to your industry, innovation or customer satisfaction or employee retention. But no matter what the measure is, there's something that's undeniable, a way in which you're getting beat in the market and you're not enjoying it. The third clue is that there are changes in your market. Now, those could be ominous changes that you've discounted or haven't taken the time to fully understand. Perhaps a new competitor shows up and their business model doesn't make any sense. It's irrational. You can't understand how they're doing it, but somehow they're making it work. Or maybe a traditional competitor of yours abandons a market. It's a core market. And at first you're elated. It's fantastic. We're rid of that competition. But then you start to wonder, did they leave that market because they thought they couldn't compete with us? Or did they decide to leave the market because they made the decision that that market is no longer worth winning. Now, either way, that's something that you need to understand or prepare to suffer the consequences. The transformation that I create for audiences is to shift from something I've heard in the past, which is my job is easy, but working here is hard. I shift from that to my job is easy and I love working here because of the way we come together to do important things. But the thing that really bothers me, that really drives me crazy about this, that really sticks in my craw is that those problems, maybe not all of those problems, but many of those problems are solvable if we would just take a different approach. That approach is deconstruction. So there's one final story I'd like to share with you that I think really pulls us all together, brings the entire deconstruction process into focus. In the year 2000, two brothers were hitting golf balls at a driving range in the UK. Now they decided that that was drudgery and just wasn't much fun at all. Unfortunately for the sport of golf, that's not a unique experience. A generation raised on video games was rapidly deciding that golf was an expensive, time-consuming luxury. A luxury, not a hobby that was difficult to learn and in the final assessment, just not worth the effort. But the brothers thought that they could help, that they could find a way to work on their game and still have fun in the process. To figure this out, they embraced the five steps of the deconstruction process. First, they declared that they would re-examine the very nature of golf itself, but not from the perspective of a purist, from the perspective of an enthusiast. So their goal was to remake golf into this engaging entertainment experience by making it more social and just plain more fun. Second, they disassembled the game of golf into its component parts and they decided to focus on the long game. Now that's typically one of the most challenging aspects of the game for beginners. And I know since I've been a beginner at golf for about 30 years <laughs> at, at this point, but they decided to focus on that because it was the area where there was the most to gain and because no one had ever done that before. Third, as they looked at the possibilities, they discovered a possible mashup of games and technologies. 
And what they decided to do was to blend a golf driving range with the social environment of a pub and combine that with the clear scoring and immediate feedback that comes from sports like darts or bowling. Now, there was an IT component to this, certainly, but one of the cool technologies that they used to pull the whole thing together was something called RFID tagging. And what that allowed them to do was to actually label each and every golf ball individually. So if you're a golfer and you smack that ball out there, you've got instant feedback about where the ball went, how you hit it, and what your score is. So no more lost balls, no more drudgery putting in time on the range wondering what, what happened. Just no more drudgery. Fourth, they delivered this concept to major cities across the UK and the US, and they called it flat out fun. This is golf, right? But it's flat out fun the way you encounter it at Top Golf. And the final aspect of this is that Top Golf is digesting the feedback that they're receiving from their customers about this new market that they've created. Now they've got things like meeting spaces for corporate meetings and, and, and family events and that sort of thing, but they've also just started something called Top Golf TV. So what Top Golf TV is is the opportunity for media and sports personalities to talk about their encounters with this exhilarating entertainment experience, which used to be golf, but is now Top Golf. And by the way, the personalities that they're working with go straight at the 18 to 34 year old demographic that they view as critical to the success of Top Golf, and which, by the way, doesn't really feel very connected with the sport of golf. So by many measures, the traditional sport of golf is really very challenged, right? 10 golf courses close for every one that opens every year in the United States, and it's estimated that 200,000 golfers give up the sport every year. But that's golf, not Top Golf. Top Golf has got 37 locations open, and trust me, they're booming. They've got 18 more in the plans, which will give Top Golf a total of 55 locations in six countries on four continents. Now, if two brothers can do that with something as entrenched as golf, just imagine what you can do with all the things that you've got to work with. What I wish for organizations today is that they stop asking for someone else to empower them and embrace, wrap their arms around the power that they already have to make change in the world. If you can take the principles of deconstruction and apply them to the challenges that you encounter every day, that your best days, our best days, lie ahead. So when you return to the office, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to take a fresh look at your junk drawer and I would like you to declare the services that you want that drawer to provide to you. Next, I want you to disassemble your habits around that drawer I'd like you to discover new potential opportunities and uses for that drawer. I'd like you to deliver that capability, that service model, back to yourself. And then I would like you to digest what you've learned in the process. Now, as you work through the deconstruction process around your junk drawer, your drawer will probably improve. But the good news is that even if the drawer doesn't improve, your brain will. Because all the research shows that the simple process of thinking about problems in this way boots up your creative mind. And once you boot up your creative mind, the probability skyrockets that you'll be able to deal with your daily challenges in a way that's organized and purposeful. If I could wave my magic wand and change one thing about business, it would be to make leaders more curious about potential future outcomes for their organization, to see other possible futures other than just a repeat of what they've done in the past. I believe, based on my own experience and all the research I've read, that there's a deep pool of creativity and knowledge and experience that's trapped in our organizations. And it's trapped there by traditional management and leadership practices. Now, one of the most poignant ways I've heard that expressed came from a sales leader that I worked with at one point in my career. And she told me 
You know, my job is easy, but working here is hard. So another example of the deconstruction process in action is the Adidas Speed Factory. Adidas is a leader in the manufacturing and selling of athletic shoes worldwide. Globally, that's an $80 billion industry. Now, we all love to wear our running shoes and cross trainers, but the industry itself is not without controversy. Over the past couple of decades, it's become accepted wisdom that the one right way to manufacture athletic shoes is in low-cost labor markets in very high volumes. In practice, that means that the decision to roll out a new design is a complex exercise in global finance and logistics, and that creates some problems. There are concerns with labor practices in far-off markets. There are concerns with the impact of global shipping on the world's oceans and climate change. The leadership at Adidas decided to challenge those assumptions. They began by declaring that they thought it was possible to manufacture an affordable athletic shoe close to or maybe even in the market where it would be consumed. The additional benefits to that would be that it would allow for highly customized designs while carrying very little or no inventory. Next, Adidas disassembled the entire process from beginning to end to make sure that they understood every aspect of demand and design and manufacturing. Third, the company discovered new possibilities by looking at the available technologies, determining if new technologies needed to be developed or existing technologies need to be better integrated. And some of those technologies include 3D printing, robotics, and computerized knitting. Fourth, Adidas delivered that concept to market in something called a speed factory, where shoes could be developed in the market where they would be consumed. The first shoe off the line was called the MFG, made for Germany. That's pretty cool. And finally, Adidas is digesting what they've learned from this process and applying it to other aspects of their business. They're expanding it into a larger concept that's called AM4, Adidas made four. And you just complete that sentence with the name of your local market. That's the concept. But the really cool thing about this is that the principles that they're discovering as they go through this, this deconstruction process may well apply to the global garment industry. This could be revolutionary and change the entire industry. So what Adidas has been able to do here is to consider a future where they move from a model that's built on cheap, distant labor and huge bets on new designs to one where you've got customized manufacturing and that mass customization that occurs in the market itself. Now, there's a clear lesson here. Perfectly rational people had arrived at a set of perfectly rational conclusions that there was exactly one best way to manufacture athletic shoes in very high volumes with standardized designs in the cheapest labor markets possible. But when someone, Adidas leadership, decided to challenge those assumptions, an entire new opportunity presented itself. And that brings a challenge to all of us. What assumptions are we taking for granted? Those assumptions that may have been accurate at one point, but no longer are because of the rate of change in the world today. Assumptions about our markets, the way we serve them, what our customers want from us, the technology we use, the way we use it, what we've integrated it with, the kinds of things that keep us doing things in the way we always have. The assumptions that if you were a competitor coming into your industry, you'd want to find out and capitalize upon. What are we doing to dig out those assumptions, to find new tools that we can use in our businesses, repetitive tasks that no longer make sense, can be eliminated or automated, and new approaches that allow us and our employees to challenge our perspective and become free to see new opportunities in these markets going forward.